thing the same. Yeah. I think it's something new either. How is it? How is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like the hydrograph. Hmm? Hey, do you know what we have? Hmm? They all ask about that, but no, you have a printer. No, I don't know. You don't know? Because they don't. Yeah, I think there was no color from today. But I asked the dance expert. It's getting too hot out here. There is no color from this semester. Oh, maybe. Maybe that's true. I think, yes. to talk about approximation algorithms because, as I said uh, two weeks ago, NP-complete pr problems are all equally hard if what you want to do is solve them exactly um, and in the worst case. But if you are willing to accept some sort of approximate solution or some good solution as opposed to the best solution, well, then different problems really have different hardnesses. And, um, you know, as, as you probably know, but I think it's important to say, um, you know, at this point, proving that something is NP-complete is usually the beginning of the story, not the end. 
right? It's not like, oh, it's NP-complete, so there's nothing left to do. Well, if it's a problem we care about, then that's not enough. Um, we want to know, is there an approximate solution? Um, are there special cases of it which are NP? Uh, what happens if we look at typical solutions instead of worst case ones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Um, in fact, at this point, uh, it's very rare for a result that a problem is NP-complete to be considered interesting and new. Every once in a while, there's a cute result, which gets some press, like a while ago when someone <coughs> proved that, in a certain sense, the game of Minesweeper was NP-complete. Um, and there are, there are a handful of problems where it's still not known uh, whether they're NP-complete, but they might be. But for the most part, you know, um, <coughs> Proving NP completeness stopped being really interesting in the 1980s or so. So it's an important it's an important uh, concept, but you know you, you want to go beyond it. So if we have more time at the end of the semester, we'll talk about some randomized algorithms. Um, so for instance, uh, if you have three set, well you know if you have n variables. Then a brute force search takes two to the n time. Um, there is a randomized algorithm which takes a random walk in the space of possible solutions, which takes four thirds to the n time. This is still exponential, but it's a whole lot better than two to the n, for instance. Um, and uh, so the whole world of randomized algorithms is very fascinating. It, it turns out that being able to make random choices um, gives you a lot of cute algorithmic ideas, many of which don't have a direct analog in the deterministic algorithms that we're used to. So for instance, when I teach undergraduate algorithms, um, when I teach 361, I show some randomized algorithms because it's the sort of thing which needs to filter down into the curriculum because many of them are not that hard to understand and are a lot of fun. Um, and uh, so I'll try to fit one or two of those in. How many of you know about this algorithm, which is called WalkSat? Do any of you know about it? It's, it's incredibly simple. It's sort of your simplest version of like a local search algorithm. I mean, if you've played around with the genetic algorithms, you know about local search algorithms and hill climbing algorithms. Well, this isn't even genetic. There's no mating or crossover. You just start with a random assignment of all the variables, and then you start flipping variables in an effort to try to make the clauses happy. That's it. That's the whole idea. And you can prove that if the formula is satisfiable, then with high probability, this process will find a solution within this much time. So this is in average, average time? Or this is... This is for this is worst case as far as the instance goes, but it's high probability regard, with regard to the randomness of the walk, right? So the adversary gets to choose the three sat formula, but then you start taking this random walk, and if the three sat formula is satisfiable, then with high probability your walk will bump into an assignment with this probability. So, I, I'm sorry, I, I, after, this, after this much time. Um, you know, so this is still exponential, so this sort of thing, if you, fo if you focus entirely on questions like P versus NP or polynomial versus exponential, then you'll never even care about questions like this. But you should care about it because, you know, some exponentials are a lot less exponential than others. Um, and also, it's a very nice idea. So, and it has nothing to do with backtracking search. It's just a random walk. Um, okay. So there are lots of interesting things we can do with a problem, even after we know it's NP-complete. But what I want to spend the next two weeks or so on is, um, and do we only have three weeks of class left, or is it four? Probably we can do a couple lectures during finals week. Oh, sure, sure. Um, all right. So, uh, well, what I want to spend the next two or three lectures on um, 
is computational complexity when the limited resource is not the amount of time you have to run your program, but the amount of memory it has access to. So this is what chapter six is about, which you're supposed to be reading right now. And when, you know, when we focus on memory, we get a whole different set of complexity classes. And one interesting thing about them is that where this distinction between deterministic and non-deterministic is concerned, the memory bounded classes, or as they're often called space bounded classes, act very differently from the time bounded ones. So, um, all right, so let's, let's talk about this a little bit. So basically, let's first define, so remember that we, we had time f of n, the set of problems you can solve within order big O of f of n time. Well, space f of n is the set of problems we can solve with a program that uses this much memory. And, you know, just to remind you uh, what this means, memory, memory is sort of, the, the, the space of all states that your computer can possibly be in is a really big space, right? So let's say that you've got a couple gig of RAM and you've got your hard drive too. Let's, let's include your hard drive in case you need to store stuff there. So altogether, you might have around 10 to the 11th bits in your computer. So since each one of these can be zero or one, the set of all possible states you can be in, your computer can be in, is this, which is a really enormous number. Okay. And um, so there's a lot of room to wander around in here. And in particular, uh, with this much memory, you can certainly do lots of things that take exponential time. <coughs> okay. So in some sense, memory is bigger than time. We'll, we'll explain that a little bit more as we go on. Um, so, uh, so in fact, let's prove a couple of simple relationships between our memory classes and our time classes. Um, and uh, by, by the way, we'll also say, just as we did with P, P space is, well, informally, it's what you can do in polynomial space. More formally, it's the union over all k of what you can do in n to the k space. Okay, so what you can do in n or n cubed or n to the seventh or n to the 39th and to any constant. So the setting is that just as in the time bounded case, each time I hand you a bigger instance of the problem, I'm gonna give you more time to run your program. Now, every time I hand you a bigger instance, I'm going to buy you a bigger computer to run it on. Um, now, uh, one thing is, da, 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 uh, what do we count as the space? What do we count as the memory? So, um, and, and we, want to, we want to talk about this without getting into the details of computer architecture, right? Um, so basically the idea is that you have a certain workspace in your computer, and these are the bits that you can read and write. Okay, you can modify them any way you like. You can read them back. Um, so this is roughly speaking what you'd call the RAM and the disk. Well, where does the program live? Well, it kind of doesn't matter, because after all, the program just takes some constant size anyway. But if you want to think of it as living in the memory, fine. Certainly, that's where software generally lives. If you want to think of it as hardwired onto a chip, that's fine too. I don't really care. So the, the program itself is just of constant size. I don't care whether it's in the hardware or the software. Um, but what about the input? So. 
normally we think of you know putting the input into the memory of the computer where it can then be manipulated like any other part of the workspace. But there's actually an advantage to thinking of the, of the input as being separate because there's an interesting class called L, or some people write it out as log space. I'm going to call it L. And this is what you can do. This is the set of problems you can solve with only log n, order log n memory, where n is the size of the problem you're trying to solve. Okay. Well, this is absurd if the input is being put in the memory, because then you would need n bits of memory to hold the n bits of, n bits of input. So what do I have in mind when I say this? Well, the idea is that the input is living maybe on some optical disk, okay, some read-only device, an external read-only device. And this complexity class is actually not so crazy, because if you're an astrophysicist, say, and you've just returned from the South Pole, you may have collected a terabyte of data from your radio telescopes, and your computer does not have a terabyte of RAM. So your algorithms for analyzing this are, <clears throat> you know, the workspace is very small compared to this huge stack of optical disks or whatever. And so what your algorithm will do is it will selectively go and, you know, go and read a, go and read a block of that put that in the workspace, go and do something with it, then go and read a block of that, put it in the workspace, go and do something with it, and so on. And the point of this complexity class is there are some very interesting problems where um, the amount of workspace you need to solve a problem of size n is much, much smaller, like only log n. Okay? Once the memory you have is much bigger than n, well, th this distinction doesn't matter. But to explore classes like this, um, then we need to think of the input as being in some read-only place. So we don't get charged for it in terms of our memory. All right. So Okay, so let's write down some simple relations between, between time and space. Um, okay, so suppose I tell you that I can solve a problem in this much memory. What's an upper bound on the amount of time I could possibly need? Well, hopefully I can do it in less than that. Yeah, I mean, so the point is that, yes, the program could get stuck in an endless loop. That's true. But if the program works and it halts, I mean, if you have if you have this many different states you can be in, okay, because you have f of n bits of memory, well, if the computer's, at the moment we're talking only about deterministic things. So I mean, if the computer ever gets into the same state twice, it'll do the same things again, and it'll be stuck in an endless loop. So that means that any program which works and halts uh, can only take this many different steps, because otherwise, by the pigeonhole principle or whatever, it's hit the same state twice and it's fallen into an endless loop. <coughs> All right, good. Um, what about on the other side? I claim uh, this. <coughs> so I claim that if you run in f of n time, <coughs> you need at most f of n memory. Why is that? You know, worst case, isn't it? I don't know what you mean. 
you know, we'll visit the same state. Yeah. For every step, there's a state and no loops, each so step by step. Yes, but why does that tell you? I mean, you at least have to look at your input. Okay, I see. Well, the input is living somewhere else. I mean, let, let, let's, let's, for specificity, let's say that F is polynomial in N. So in particular, I claim that P is contained in P space. I claim that any algorithm which runs in polynomial time only needs a polynomial amount of memory. Yes, it will be more memory than, than we need more time just to read it. Yes. It, it, if we had more memory, we would need more time to read it, or as somebody said, the, yeah, I mean, the point is that if each step of the program accesses, say, one byte of memory, or a block of memory, I don't care, some constant amount of memory, then in T time steps, you only have time to look at or read or write T blocks of memory. So you're never going to need more than that. Now, we're cheating a wee bit because you could imagine that you have a really massive amount of memory and that depending on your input, you either look at this block or this block and so on. Okay. Yeah. So it's certainly true, for instance, in a, in a random access machine, I could give you a 32-digit string and ask you, to run a program which stores a bit of input in that location. Okay, and I could address an exponentially large amount of memory. But this would be silly, <laughs> because if you only run your program for t time steps, there will only be a total number of t places in this memory, this huge memory that you actually look at. So one thing I could do is I could cheat. I could run something that looks like a huge RAM, but isn't really. You could tell me, store something in the 32 zillionth location. And I'll say, righty-o, I've done that. And I could write down in my memory, I've stored something in the 32 zillionth place. And then next time you try to read something from that place, I check my table of fictional places I've claimed to store things for you, and then I say, oh, yes, here's the thing you stored there. And as long as you only look at a polynomial number of different places in this huge memory, I can do the simulation with a polynomial amount of memory. Does this make sense? This is like a virtual memory concept, no? I'm sure it is. Yes. Something to do with <coughs> these computer things, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the idea. So I, I can simulate a big address space as long as you only ever look at a few things in it. Good. So, um, so what we know so far is that, uh, since I ran out of space here, time of f of n is contained in space of f of n, which is in turn con contained, sorry, I didn't mean to say equal. I apologize. That's contained in time 2 to the order f of n. So in particular, L, or log space, um, well, according to this, what is log space contained inside? If f is log, what is this? It's polynomial, because 2 to the order of log is exactly polynomial. For instance, 2 to the 10 log n is n to the 10th, if the log is base 2. So L is contained in P. According to this, P is contained in P space. According to this, that's contained in exponential time, <coughs> where I should emphasize that when a computer scientist says exponential, they mean 2 to a polynomial of n, not just 2 to the n. So 2 to the n squared, 2 to the n cubed are also considered exponentials. This, in turn, is contained in exponential space, which is 
pretty much bigger than anybody can think about. That's contained in doubly exponential time and so on. So this pair of inclusions gives us this kind of alternating uh, hierarchy of complexity classes bouncing back and forth between how much time you have and how much memory you have. All right, good. So um, what about non-determinism? So first of all, um, what about n time of f of n? Okay, let me remind you what this is. So this is the set of problems for which, if the answer is yes, there is a witness of length, order f of n, which can be checked in order f of n time. All right. So now suppose I'm trying to solve this kind of problem deterministically. So there's no n here. How much memory do I need? It's again just, uh, oh wait, no, sorry. Yeah, so what, here's one way to do it. Well, how many possible witnesses are there? Two to the f of n. Okay. Well, so now tell me how much memory I need to check all of them. Each of them is polynomial of length. Well, each of them can be checked in f of n time. Let's call it f. Okay, f of n time. So to do an exhaustive search, to go through all things, all 2 to the f of n strings, possible witnesses, um, each of which is of length f of n. So how much memory do I need for that? F of n. It's just f of n. F of n. You can reuse memory. Because memory can be reused, okay. right? So what you do is you, you know, you have this block of memory of length f of n. You start out with the potential witness, which is all zeros. Now in this block of memory, you run the witness checking program. The witness checking program runs in order f of n time, so it only needs f of n memory. Then if that witness doesn't work, you go back and go to the next one, increment <coughs> the 0 to 1, and keep going. So okay. by, by space f of n, you mean memory bounded by f of n, and as well as the running time is f of n? No. The only bound here is the space. I mean, this will take exponential time, right? Okay. Th th this will take time, oh, basically f of n times 2 to the f of n, right? Yeah. The time to check each one times the number of potential witnesses. So you don't actually care about the, the time when you consider in space. Exactly. So I mean, in these complexity classes, we're not bounding the running time. You can have as much time as you want. All I care about is, are you going to run out of memory? Okay. So it's just a different picture of the world. I mean, normally when we think about efficiency, for the most part we think about time. Because for most applications, time is the thing we run out of first. <coughs> but that's not always the case. Sometimes what you run out of is memory. Even, I mean, even possible if you, say, you log up in space, but just, I mean, <laughs> do it for much longer. I, uh, I'm not sure what you mean. I, is it possible to use less memory if you take more time? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I mean, there, so yeah, there certainly are trade-offs. So one of the things we'll see over the next few lectures is that if what you're really worried about is memory, you can come up with some very clever algorithms that they take longer than the ones which are most efficient in terms of time. So it's possible to be very efficient in terms of memory, but there's a cost. Yeah, and so there are 
tra are typically trade-offs in algorithms between right. time and memory. But in these classes, we're just worrying about memory. Now, you could invent other complexity classes, right? So you could invent a class called space-time f, comma, g. And that would be the set of problems you can solve with f of n memory in g of n time. Those are perfectly good complexity classes, but they're different from these. But since, as you said, you can always trade memory for, for time or like vice versa? Well, you can't always. I mean, I, I think... Like lower bounds or something. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think it's possible to solve 3SAT with only, you know, one kilobyte of memory, no matter how much time you take or something like that, you know. I mean, there's, there, so there's some limit to how much you can trade time for memory or vice versa. But it's, it's true that um, optimizing one might not be the same as optimizing another. But the big thing is that memory, memory can be reused. And this makes it act rather differently as a computational resource than the way time works, because time, sadly, cannot be reused. So. Um, when we do things like organize an exhaustive search, well, we're doing it sort of more compactly, if you like, in memory in, than in time. That's like comparing apples and oranges, but I hope you see the point. Okay. All right, so let's, in, in particular, we can expand the picture we had before a little bit. We'll put L and then P and then NP, and then that's inside P space. And that's inside exp time, which in turn is inside nexp time, and so on. All right, well, if we're going to have non-deterministic time classes, we ought to have non-deterministic space classes. So we need to think a little bit about what that means. And in order to come up with the right definition of non-deterministic space, um, let's look at a problem from long ago, namely reachability. <clears throat> so um, here's the idea. So suppose that your um, Suppose that I'm trying to prove to you that there is a path from one place to another in a graph. Okay? So I'm trying to prove to you that yes, you can get from S to T. I'm trying to provide a witness. Well, normally, uh, normally I can just show you the whole path, right? I mean, reachability is in P, so it's certainly in NP. So I can show you the whole path. But now, imagine that you're living in a really, really huge graph, okay? For instance, imagine that each vertex of this graph is one of the 2 to the 10 to the 12th or whatever states in your computer. So this graph has an exponentially large number of vertices. It's really, really big. So that means that the path might be this long. Okay? So you have this much memory, but the path could be as long as this. So you don't have enough memory you can't handle the witness, right? You don't have enough memory for me to show you the whole path. You can't hold it all in your mind at once, right? Mm -hmm. But there's another way that I, the prover, could give you, the verifier, this witness. How's that? Prove that each step is correct and show one step at a time. Yes, I could take you by the hand and show you one step of the path at a time. Okay? That way you don't need to store it all at once. Yep. And for that matter, when you're in the middle of it, you don't remember how you got there. <laughs> okay? All you need to know is where you are, and all I show you is where to go next. 
And at the end of the day, I've gotten you there, and you say, ah, yes, I agree, you got me here. I guess you were right. I guess there was a way to get from S to T. So um, inspired by this example, we're going to write down what might look like a sort of funny definition, but it's actually, it's actually the most natural one. So <clears throat> um, here was our definition of n time. My definition of n space will be um, so. Uh, well, okay. I wanted to erase less, but it's too late now. Okay. So. Um, so remember that the input is written in this read-only device and that you have workspace here. Workspace, which is read and write. All right, so let me phrase it this way. I'm going to give you a witness, which is not just read only, but it's also left to write. Okay? So here's the whole thing. If X is a yes instance, there is a witness. W such that we can check W in order f of n space, where n is the length of s, is the, is the length of the input x as always. Given read only access to x and read only left to right access to W. So I know this looks slightly technical, but the point is that W is the kind of witness, it's like showing you the path through a long graph. So the idea is that if so far you've read this part of the witness, you might as well have burned everything to the left of it. Every time you step forward on it, you can never go back. So when you get to a place where you're trying to check W and you, know, and you need to read the next bit, you can read the next bit. But you have to read them in that order. And this is meant to model this picture that I show you a path by showing you one step at a time. Okay. So with this definition, I claim that reachability is in NL, N log space. Okay. So what does this mean? I mean that I have a graph. with n vertices, and I claim that we only need log n bits of workspace. And the witness is the path. So explain to me what I do and why I only need log n bits to do it. So remember, what am I given? I'm given a description of the graph G on my read-only optical disk. Anytime you want to know, for instance, whether there's an edge from one vertex to another, you can go and read the disk and it will tell you. You can't write on it, you can't use it as workspace, that would be cheating, but you can look at it. Okay? 
And part of the input also is, you know, S and T. And the witness, W, is going to be this sequence of vertices that get you to T, in our, that, that follow this path. So how do I, how do I check this witness using only log n space. Why do I only need log n space? What am I going to do with that space? Probably all what you need is the space to check if a vertex connects to the other or not. So if V0 connected to V1 or not. Just How much space do I need to do that? Uh, for one for one edge. For one path between a vertex and the other. Yeah. So, so if you have like n vertices. So I'll, I'll, I'll start by reading S. In, so here's my workspace. I'll start by reading S into my workspace. Or outgoing edges. Well, I'm not sure I can read all the outgoing edges. No, no. Yeah. Right? I mean, if S has a lot of outgoing edges, I can't store them all. Yeah, that's right. Right? But, but again, remember, the witness is supposed to have done all the work for me. We're not supposed to have to do any searching. We're just checking the witness. Okay. V0 equals right, so so I checked. Yeah, let's say this equals. Well, I'll, I'll check that V0 equals S. That's easy, right? But and then then I'll put V0 here, and then I'll read V1, and then what do I do? You put V1 instead of V0 and V2. Okay, all right. And what do I do to make sure that this is legal, that this witness is valid? You, you check, check your you check read over your graph and make sure that you want V2 is in there. Right. So what I do is I, you know, G has this table of the adjacency matrix or whatever of the graph. So I go and read G. Okay. But the idea is it doesn't it doesn't take me memory to do that. Okay. So if I have V1 and V2, I can go read. Uh, I'll scan through G on this read-only device until I find, depending on the format, maybe it, for each vertex it has a list of its outgoing neighbors. So I scan it until I get to V, uh, V1, and then I read through that list to see if it contains V2. Mm -hmm. And if it does, I say, okay, that was a valid edge. This edge really exists. Move this over here. Read V3 into here. Do it again Place until five. finally I check to see if it equals T. It looks like two. <laughs> Well, big O, yeah. Okay. okay. But so why why does this only take log n workspace? Okay, I see. Big O. Because all I'm remembering here is basically my current location and maybe where the witness has asked me to go next. What is it? Okay. It's not even obvious that I need to store both of these at once, by the way. I mean, I could store one of them and then, well, maybe. I, I don't know. I guess we need to also store how, where we are in the witness, so how many steps we've taken. But that's another integer between 0 and n, right, if there are n vertices. So if I'm at the ith step here, Let's say that I'm currently checking to see whether there is something from. So this is an integer from 1 to n. This is an integer from 1 to n. This is an integer from 1 to n. And we need only log n bits to store such things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, we don't remember where we've been. We only we do, we only know where we're where we are right now. Okay. But the witness carefully leads us by the hand. We go and ask the graph, can I go this way? The witness says I should go here next. Can I? The graph says yes. Then we keep going through it, and at the end we've gotten where we want to go. Okay. So the point is that, I mean, the search problem of telling whether there is a path, that might be hard. Okay. But we're in 
NL, so all we're trying to do is verify a path, and the point is it takes very little workspace to verify a path. You only need log n bits because all you need to remember is where you are right now. Any questions? Yes? Why do you need the, uh, the I? Check the length of oh, I, I'm not sure if you, let's see, I don't, even, I don't even know if you do. I was just thinking that maybe you need to see, you know, if this path works, you need to know which to look up next. But I guess you could scan the, the path to see the current vertex. I don't even know if you need that. Maybe to avoid something for a loop? I don't know. Well, I mean, if the witness is cheating, then... I mean, notice the witness could actually say, okay, go here, now go back there, okay, do that a few more times. And you're like, okay, good, good. And then, and finally it goes there. Well, you're fine with that. Okay. I mean, as long as, as long as the witness gets you to T. And the point is that... Yeah, we don't care about time. <laughs> yeah, we don't care about time, in fact. Um, we don't even much care about the length of the witness. We just care that there exists a witness, a valid witness, if, if and only if the answer is yes. And by the very definition of reachability, there exists a path, if and only if the answer is yes. Why is this in NL and not L? Because L, L it's just like P and NP, right? So in P, you have to find the solution. In NP, someone gives you a witness and you check it. Yeah. So in L, we would have to find the path. And it's not clear that reachability is in L. Yes? I was going to say there's a size limit to W as well. <coughs> there is a size limit to W, but in some sense we don't need to impose a size limit on W. If W is too long, it just means that we are going in, in we have gone around a loop a couple times, which is perverse, but as long as we get where we're going in the end, it still works as a witness. But yes, maybe we should. Um, it's certainly true that if there is a witness, then there is a witness of size at most uh, two to the workspace. Because otherwise, we're going in some sort of endless loop. All right. Well. Reachability is in NL, but maybe we can say something stronger. I mean, reachability, the way we've defined NL, the fact that we've defined it using these left to right witnesses, makes it look a lot like reachability is the NL question, uh -huh. right? Namely, that reachability is, drum roll, Drum roll. Is a witness NL complete? Okay. Right. So. Like the. So yeah. It, it seems like reachability is NL complete. So, well, we need to be a little bit careful about. We need to define what we mean by NL complete before we can make this claim. Um. And uh, and we need to prove it. So, but once we get our terms right, this is sort of kind of obvious, given this definition. So, first of all, in order to define what I mean by NL complete, presumably what this means is any problem a in NL can be reduced to reachability, but reduced how? Um, when we defined NP completeness, we said, well, if you can reduce it in polynomial time, that's good enough. But now that we've, now that our zoo of complexity classes is starting to grow, a polynomial time reduction is only one possible reduction, right? You could ask for p-space reductions or 
exponential time reductions. But in general, if you're going to define completeness for a class, you should use a kind of reduction which is much weaker than that class. Right? I mean, we used polynomial reductions for NP completeness partly because we wanted to say if any, pro if any NP complete problem is NP, then all of NP is NP. So, what about the um, what about the L versus NL problem, like the P versus NP problem? Okay, so um, so let's say that we use that we're going to use log space reductions to define. NL completeness, just like we use polynomial time reductions to define NP completeness. What is a log space reduction? Well, it's a function which can be calculated in log space. That means that it has to be able to take inputs of size n. Presumably, it takes them in read-only form. It has a little bit of workspace. And then it has some, and then it can produce some output. So both the input and the output are, are a lot bigger than its workspace is. Okay. So there's a couple ways to think about this. One is that it has a printer, and it has a write-only device as well as a read-only device. But there's another better way to think about it, which is a function f is in log space if for each, um, so uh, let's see. What we're going to do is we're going to compute it one bit at a time. Okay? So what we're going to do is, given x and i read only, we can calculate the ith bit of x with log n workspace. Okay, so this way we don't have to hold the output in memory. You want one bit of it, you want the 37th bit, I'll give that to you. You want the third bit, I'll give that to you. So this is important because for the following reason. Remember that um, in our whole study of NP completeness, we used the fact that if I can reduce one problem to, if I can reduce A to B in polynomial time, which I'll write like this, and if I can reduce B to C in polynomial time, then I can reduce A to C in polynomial time. Okay, and this was kind of painfully obvious, but it was really important because that way we were able to build this family tree of NP-complete problems and we didn't have to start from scratch every time. Well. There, it's slightly nervous making here about log space reductions because let's say that here's an instance of problem A. With a little bit of workspace, I'm supposed to convert it to an instance of problem B. And then with a little bit of workspace, I'm supposed to convert that into an instance of problem C. The question is, can I go from A to C? in log space. Well, the problem is you can't first calculate this and then use it as your input because you don't have enough memory to hold it. <laughs> but we can still survive by playing this trick of calculating one bit at a time. The point is that how do you calculate C? Well, you have this log space program, which every once in a while wants to look at a bit of B, imagining that B is written on some read-only device. So I'm going to simulate B for you. Okay, I'm not actually going to store B anywhere, 
But every time this program, which is trying to calculate C, wants to look at a particular bit of B, I will use this program to calculate that bit of B from A. Okay? So this way, I will calculate bits of B on demand for you and make this program think that I have B when I don't really. I'm just recalculating, recalculating each part of it that it looks at. Is this efficient in terms of time? No, because I'm probably going to recalculate the same bit many, many times. Every time you look at the hundredth bit, I'm going to recalculate it from scratch. That's okay. We're just trying to be efficient in terms of memory. Stu, you have like a workspace of like the submission of two. Well, okay, but that's just still big O. Yes, yes, it's true that we need this workspace, and every once in a while, this calls this program as a kind of subroutine. So we need its workspace too. So the total workspace is the two of them, but so fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So um, the question is, can I take any problem in NL and reduce it in log space to reachability? The answer is yes, if you believe that uh, you can take a computer program, put it inside a computer, and run it by running one instruction at a time. And you believe this because this is what you do every day. So what are we going to do? So by definition, if a problem is in NL, then it has this little workspace of size log n. So what is the graph? What, what is, how big is the graph of all the states that this workspace can ever be in? Uh, well, it's order log n, so it's polynomial. So in other words, if you only have log n workspace, you only have a polynomial number of different states you can ever be in. So one thing we could do is just literally write out that entire graph and then solve reachability on it. Well, we can't quite do that because we don't have room to hold the whole graph. But all we need to do is be able to answer questions that the reachability algorithm wants to ask, the, the witness checker wants to ask. And all it ever asks is, is there, here's a vertex u and here's a vertex v. Is there an edge from u to v? Yes or no? We just need to be able to answer that question. Yes? Usually, when you type the white space, I don't care about the input, where is it stored, and I don't care about the program itself. Right. That's why I got, I mean, this polynomial time is just needed for the space that the witness will need. I don't care about where G is stored, and I don't care about the program, where the program is stored, right? Right. But, but so if you have a problem with in, uh, NNL, it's going to use some workspace, and there's this is the number of different states the bits of the workspace could ever be in. Check. Yeah. I don't care about the input. Where is it stored? Right. Oh. So. The, well, the input is stored on a read-only device. So right. whatever G is big, how, 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 how big is G is, I don't care about according to this uh, polynomial space. Right. But imagine that I hand you a program which uses log and memory. Okay. okay. You need to convert this program to a graph in order to reduce this problem to a reachability problem. Okay. Then this okay. graph is not input anymore. It is input right. For it's the input. simulated input, just like this diagram I just had before. We're going to make the program for reachability think it has access to a graph. So now I count it as a space needed. But 
which we don't have enough room for it, to hold it all at once. But we don't need it all at once. Okay. We, don't need all we only need to answer one question at a time of the form, is there a path, is there an edge from here to here? But what does this mean in the case of a program? It means that this vertex is some state of the workspace. And this vertex is some other state of the workspace. And we're asking, can I go from here to here in a single step? But the state of the workspace of your computer tells you everything that the CPU needs to know to run the next step of the program. It contains the values of the variables. It has a pointer to what line, if it, let's, let's ignore whether this is interpreted or compiled. It has a program pointing to what line of the, uh, it has a pointer pointing to what line of the program you're about to run next. So if I show you this state, which is some string of bits, it tells you the entire state of the computer, the entire state of the program, including what instruction it's about to execute. So all I need to do is simulate one step of the program to tell whether that would take me from this vertex to this one. You know, this is a wee bit abstract. No, okay, good. Some yes, some no, that's fine. Uh, so, so now I'm just going to make the following claim. I, if I have a program that only needs log n bits of memory, I can simulate it in log n bits of memory. I can, I can set it up in a certain state and then do a step of the program and see what the new state is. Like simulating itself, almost like the... Uh languages <laughs> well yeah I mean I, I mean I, I'm trying I'm I, I deliberately don't want to talk about the details of the programming language um, you know but uh, you know but the point is each individual step is something like flip this bit or write this bit in that bit or increment X or something okay. um, so uh, yeah, so, so the point is that in these log space reductions, because we're only trying to generate one bit at a time, we only need to convert this into reachability. We only need to generate one bit of the state space graph of the computer at a time. In other words, answer for one edge at a time, is there an edge from here to there or not? Does that mean what, for any program of finite size is always NL. Uh, um, no, it, it means that reachability is NL, is NL complete because any program that only needs log n bits. What do you mean by any program needs log n bits? <laughs> well, a, a, any program which is uh, which only needs log n bits of workspace to check witnesses for inputs of size n. Oh, you, I see, you see you're trying to say it's z, which really is z and l. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of nl complete almost by the definition of nl, okay? But I mean, you know, but we need to think about the fact that to take other problems in l and convert them into reachability problems, we have to, I mean, what I'm gonna give you is a program and you need to look at the source code of this program and generate this graph. And then you run reachability to see if starting with the initial state of the program, it will lead to a final state that says yes. Happily, you don't need to generate the graph all at once though, since you don't have enough memory to hold it. Instead, you can simulate access to it one bit at a time by simulating the program one bit at a time. All right, so I, I know this is slightly mysterious. This stuff, will, this stuff gets easier, actually. It's sort of hardest down here in the log space world where we have to think of, uh, in this careful way about one bit at a time. 
once we get up to polynomial space, well, we have all the memory. We need to hold lots of things. But it's, um, uh, yeah, did you have a question? Uh, I was just uh, wondering if you want to prove something, if it's an, an L or not, do you have to try to find a way to reduce it to reachability? Um, yes, so this also means uh, that um, any problem which can be easily converted into a reachability problem is in an L. But when I say easily, well, you have to do it in log space, okay? Now, but I want to, let's, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about these log space reductions because the fact is that although we allow ourselves polynomial time reductions and our definition of NP completeness, most of the reductions we've seen are actually doable in logarithmic space. Okay, why is that? Well, you know, remember our reduction from, let's say, NAE 3 sat to 3 coloring. Remember that was the one where for each variable we had a pair of vertices yeah. and for each clause we had a triangle. Okay, well, I claim that if I give you read-only access to a 3 sat formula and I ask you a simple question about this graph, like is there an edge from here to there, you can answer that question very easily with very little workspace just by looking at the formula. Okay? So what we'll do is we'll give these vertices names. So I'll call this clause 1, and then this will be C11, C12, C13, and this will be variable, you know, 1 comma 1, variable 1 comma 2. I don't know. I don't care how you give the names. Whatever. Right? The point is that now if I'm asking you a question about the graph, one like, is there a vertex named C27, 3? You just have to go and look at the formula to see if there are 27 clauses or not, or more. If I ask you, is there an edge from V1, 1 to C1, 1, you just need to check the formula to see if the first variable appears in the first clause. Okay? So, in other words, log space reductions include these things which we can call local gadget reductions, right? I'm not taking the three sat formula and doing some complicated polynomial time computation on it and getting a graph. Each little bit of the graph corresponds to a little bit of the formula. It's a very local transformation. And that means that if I ask you a question about the graph, you just need to go glance at the formula, look at a few things, and you can answer my question. And that means that this is actually a log space reduction. Okay. So um, these things are hopefully not so unfamiliar. All right. Um, so there's one type of thing that we haven't proved here. What about n space f of n? Is it contained in time 2 to the order f of n? So I give you an n space problem that needs f of n memory, I want you to solve it deterministically. How much time do you need? Well, I mean, an NL problem can be converted to a reachability problem on a graph with a polynomial number of vertices. To answer, no, I mean, I'm not asking you how much memory you need, just how much time. I'll give you as much memory as you want, okay? So an n space problem with f of n memory is again a reachability problem. Okay? It's again because asking whether there's a witness 
that leads me from the initial state to a final state is again just like asking for a path. But how big is the graph? How many vertices does the corresponding graph have if I have fn bits of workspace, once again? Two to the f of n. So the point is, any problem in n space of f of n is a reachability problem on a graph with, I'll call it capital N, 2 to the f of n vertices. And if I'm only worrying about time, and I'm giving you as much memory as you want, now you can, I'll, I'll give you, I'll let you write out the whole graph. Okay. And now run your favorite reachability algorithm on it. And how long does it take to solve reachability on a graph with capital N vertices? Uh, polynomial in capital N. I forget what polynomial we came up with, n cubed or something before, and n squared maybe. Well, so um, the point is that polynomial in capital N is again 2 to the big O of f of n. Right? If you square this or cube it, you just double or triple the constant in big O. So you can again solve it in time 2 to the order f of n. So to summarize um, what we know so far, So deterministic time, of course, is contained in non-deterministic time. That's contained in space, which by definition is contained in non-deterministic space with the same amount of memory. But that, in turn, is contained in deterministic time with exponentially more space. So it looks like this. NL is also in P. I mean, NL is in P because reachability is in P. Mm -hmm. But more generally, N space is in, N space of F is in time of 2 to the F. So one question is, what about non-deterministic polynomial space? Well, we can define the same thing. I mean, it's, it contains P space, and it's contained in X time. Mm -hmm. So one of the kind of kickers of space-bounded complexity is that somehow non-determinism is less powerful in the memory world than in the time world. So if I'm trying to solve a non-deterministic problem deterministically, I generally need exponentially more time, right? Yep. So, I mean, we've, we've been saying all this time, well, we think NP takes exponential time to solve deterministically. You have to do some kind of exhaustive search. It turns out that non-deterministic space acts rather differently. You only need quadratically more space. And again, this is something to do with the fact that space can be reused. So this is called Savage's theorem, and we'll prove it next time. And as a consequence, non-deterministic polynomial space equals deterministic polynomial space because this just raises the power of the polynomial. So if you can solve something non-deterministically in n, in n cubed memory, you can solve it deterministically in n to the sixth memory. 
so this is a little surprising. And, um, you know, so, so somehow at least once we, once we get above this low level down here where we only have logarithmic space, um, then putting an n in front of things somehow doesn't make as much difference in, in for space as it does for time. So we'll prove that, and then what we'll do after that is prove that playing lots of your favorite games, well, at least your favorite strategy, board games, um, is p-space complete. So generalized generalizations of Go, Hex, Chess, Checkers, Gomoku, telling whether the current player is a winning strategy in these games is p-space complete. So, and that'll be that'll be a nice place to to stop our ruminations on space. All right. So, read chapter six. Um, I'm really interested. Okay. So, so I think this first part, the stuff we did today. <laughs> where we're talking about, well, make one bit at a time, you can simulate the program, blah, 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 you have to read the witness left to right, that means a path. So um, it took me a long time to figure out how to write this, and I'm still not convinced I did that good a job. So I'm very interested, as you read Chapter 6, in how, how clear this part is. Now, of course, you can also read Sipser. Sipser talks about this, too. Sipser does it all in terms of Turing machines. And so for me, that just added a level of notation and formalism that I thought was unnecessary. The, the downside of that is that when I say, oh, well, simulate the program, some readers might think I'm being a bit vague. Whereas if you say simulate the Turing machine, because the Turing, the Turing machine is such a precise, finite model of computation, you know exactly what it means to carry out a step of the Turing machine. Here I'm trying to be a little bit more intuitive and in saying that, you know, well, carrying out a step of a program in your favorite programming language is easy. But, you know, anyway, so tell me what you think about, about uh, the early sections. I'd, I'd really like to know how clearly or unclearly they read. All right. And uh, give me homework now or by the end of the day. Usual deal into the office by 5 or electronically by midnight.